Thank you. And on that note, we'll conclude general questions and turn to First Minister's questions. Question one, Jackson Carlo. Presiding officer, Scotland's programme for international student assessment, PISA, results for science and maths have never been lower than those released this week. Have they, First Minister? First Minister. Uh, compared to the last PISA study, the performance in science and maths, according to independent statisticians, is stable, but that's not good enough in my view. We want to continue, we want to continue with the efforts to see significant improvement in maths and science, as we have seen significant improvement in reading performance recorded in the most recent PISA study. After the last study, of course, we uh, had the Scottish Attainment Challenge, the Pupil Equity Fund initiatives like the First Minister's Reading Challenge uh, to focus on literacy and reading. That is bearing fruit. What we are doing is working and we'll continue to bring the same focus to <coughs> maths and science as well. Jackson Carlo. You know, I welcome the figures in reading, but it's a little bit like people celebrating the fact they've just had their kitchen redecorated when the front two rooms in the house are on fire. The simple answer was no, they have never been lower. In fact, in science, the drop in performance is the biggest seen since 2003. First Minister, in the period since the SNP first came to office, how many of the 40 OECD and UK countries have experienced a bigger fall in standards, in science, than we have in Scotland. How many? First Look, Minister. I am not standing here saying that the performance in maths or in science is, for me or for the Scottish Government, acceptable. I'm not saying that in any way, shape or form. Uh, but after we saw a significant decline uh, in this study, we have seen a, a performance that is stabilised and we now intend to bring to bear the initiatives and interventions that will see a similar improvement in maths and science uh, to the improvement that we have seen in this survey in reading and literacy. I think that is the focus that a government uh, should bring. Of course, as we've discussed in this chamber on many, many occasions in the past, when we look at the broader indicators in Scottish education, whether that is on higher passes uh, or National 5 uh, passes, we see a picture that is of improving standards and, crucially, a closing of the attainment gap, something that is also reflected uh, in the most recent PISA study as well. So uh, the government will continue to be focused on delivering uh, these improvements, uh, similar improvements to the ones that we have uh, already been delivering in reading to science and maths, and we will get on with that job. Jackson Carlo. Presiding officer, only in the First Minister's world can it conceivably be the case that the biggest fall in standards since 2003 is stability. First Minister, the answer to the country of how many, uh, the question of how many others have seen a bigger fall was one. Just one country out of 40 has seen standards in science fall further since 2006. And in maths, Scotland has experienced the fifth biggest fall. But it's the SNP's response, something that we've just heard, which has been almost as alarming as the results themselves. Three years ago, Nicola Sturgeon said the PISA results were not good enough and I want to see them improve. This time, we've just heard denial. Here's what Professor Lindsay Patterson of Edinburgh University says. These results would make any parent wince with shame. Even worse is the disgraceful political spin which the Scottish <laughs> Government has struggled to impose on them. As those behind you laugh at this record, First Minister, how is your government going to get on top of this when it simply refuses to accept the facts? Yep. First Minister. Well, firstly, in describing maths and science as stable, I'm quoting independent statisticians, um, and that is just the facts. If I was standing here and saying I thought that was acceptable or job done or enough, Jackson Carlow might have a point. I am not doing that. Uh, we have brought a focus to bear since the last PISA survey on reading and literacy. We see a significant and a very sharp increase in, in performance there, uh, to the point that we are again, according to the independent statisticians, there are only five countries that are now uh, performing better uh, than Scotland. Uh, and we are bringing that same focus to bear on maths and science. We have a range of initiatives, changes to the curriculum, the STEM bursary, encouraging uh, career changes, 
come into uh, teaching STEM subjects uh, because we are determined to see the same improvement we have recorded in reading in science and maths and uh, together with the wider activity that's leading to that improvement in higher performance, uh, more young people leaving school with a higher, uh, more young people leaving school with the gold standard of five hires, more young people going into positive destinations. We will continue to keep that focus, uh, whatever uh, the Scottish Conservatives might want to uh, throw at us and the pupils and teachers across Scotland in the process. Jackson Carver. Officer, this is an even more lamentable response than I expected from a First Minister who wanted to be judged on education. And today it's all across our newspapers what the people of Scotland think of her handling of public services. In schools, hospitals and justice, where only this morning the chair of the Scottish Police Authority has resigned, confidence is plummeting. After the last set of PISA results, John Swinney told us this SNP's government's unwavering focus, their unwavering focus would be on improving our schools. But Nicola Sturgeon's unwavering focus has not been improving our schools, but enforcing another independence referendum on Scotland. How much more... How much more government failure does Scotland have to endure before you drop this obsession and get on with your job? First Minister. Well, when we took office, when we took office, less than half of pupils in Scotland left school with a higher qualification. Now almost two thirds leave school with Absolutely. a higher qualification. When we took office, uh, just over 20% left school with the gold standard of five hires. That is now over 30%. Uh, when we look at the household survey uh, of those with direct experience of their schools, 86% say that they are satisfied with the quality of education. I don't think that's job done, uh, but that is an indication of the focus and the progress uh, that we are and will continue to deliver. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, uh, I think it is a bit rich for Jackson Carlow um, as, as the representative of the party that has imposed a decade of austerity on Scotland to stand up here and talk about the quality of public services. What we need to take the opportunity to get rid of over the next few days is a Conservative government. That's the best thing we could do for public services, the length and breadth of our country. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what her response is to comments by Susan Deacon who has this morning resigned her post as chair of the Scottish Police Authority, saying that, and I quote her, the governance and accountability arrangements for policing in Scotland are fundamentally flawed in structure, culture and practice. Well, First Minister. Firstly, can I uh, confirm that Susan Deakin has tendered her resignation uh, I am very grateful for the work that she's done over the past two years as chair of the SPA. Uh, Parliament will be interested to know that the Justice Secretary has spoken with the SPA Vice Chair, David Crichton, who's agreed to take on the leadership of the SPA until a new chair is appointed through the uh, full public appointments uh, process. In terms of Susan Deakin's uh, comments, obviously I do uh, thank her and pay tribute to the work that she has done. I don't uh, agree with that. I would point to uh, the comments, uh, her own comment, of course, in her letter of resignation where, and I think I'm, I'm quoting her here when she says she leaves this role with her police service in a much stronger place than it was two years ago. Uh, I also point to the recent HMICS report uh, where uh, it said that there is now a consensus from key post holders in the SPA, Police Scotland and other stakeholders that the 2012 Act establishes the right model of governance uh, of police and that the functions of the SPA are sound. Uh, the Chief Inspector of Constabulary also uh, stated recently that the SP has the strongest board that it has ever had in the mixture of experience and depth of experience uh, in a number of different walks of life and professions. So uh, we will continue to take forward, the SPA will continue to take forward the changes and reforms uh, that indeed the subcommittee of this parliament has recommended so that it continues to strengthen its performance. Richard Leonard. Well, the First Minister is right in saying that in September of this year, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland did publish a report on the Scottish Police Authority. But that's about where it stops, because it found that the SBA is failing to hold the Chief Constable to account. It found that 
it was failing to facilitate local scrutiny and failing on transparency. And the report concluded that there is a fundamental conflict of interest in the SPA being both a service provider to and the scrutiny body of Police Scotland. It made absolutely clear that police scrutiny was in need of radical overhaul. So what action did the First Minister take between the publication of the Inspectorate's report and Susan Deacon's resignation today to ensure that Police Scotland is subject to adequate scrutiny? First Minister. As I'm sure Richard Leonard is aware, the SPA is taking forward changes uh, to address the issues that have been raised both by uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate and also by the subcommittee of this Parliament to address issues of leadership, uh, governance and accountability. There is progress being made in all of that, but that does not take away from the uh, conclusion uh, that the functions of the SPA are sound and that the model of governance of uh, the police service by an independent police authority is the right one. And I point again in terms of uh, Richard Leonard's question about uh, progress in giving evidence to the Justice Committee um, this week on Tuesday the 3rd of December uh, the Chief Inspector of Constabulary uh, stated that the SPA now has and I'm quoting here the strongest board that it has ever had in the real mixture of experience and depth of experience in a number of different walks of life and profession so yes issues have been raised in uh, the lifetime of the SPE these issues are being addressed and will continue to be addressed and I would hope Richard Leonard would welcome that Richard Leonard well first minister for the last two weeks You've toured the TV studios up and down the UK, boasting about your record in government. But this week, we have had confirmation that our GP practices are in crisis, that your education secretary is failing teachers and failing to provide the quality education that our young people deserve. And now today, Police Scotland has been plunged into crisis. And this comes on top. This comes on top of recent warnings from senior police officers that further cuts will be made in police numbers to meet current budgetary limits at a time, at a time when violent crime is rising in Scotland. So, First Minister, the SNP has been in office for 12 years. When will you finally take the opportunity to take responsibility, to apologise to the people and accept that none of Scotland's public services can be trusted in your government's hands. First Minister. Of course, crime is, crime is lower than it was when the SNP took office. It is at one of its lowest levels in decades now. And of course, uh, we have invested in ensuring that there are a thousand more police officers yeah, yeah. on the streets of Scotland. I know that Richard Leonard it's quite happy for Scotland to be governed by a Tory government, but at the time we've been investing in a thousand more police officers, they've been slashing police numbers by 20,000. So this government will continue to invest in our public services. We will continue to take forward essential reforms in our public services, which is why the people of Scotland will continue, I believe, to put their trust in the SNP and in this Scottish government to get on with the job that we're doing. Thank you. We have some constituency supplementary questions. The first from Christine Graham. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister share my concern that Borderline Helpline, supporting my constituents who are experiencing mental health problems, which has received 90,000 calls since it began 20 years ago, has been given six months' notice that it will lose all its funding shared between NHS Borders and Tory-led Scottish Borders Council, despite independent valuations, including that of SBC, considering it exceptional value for money, compounded by no consultation. Does she agree that there should be a full consultation and any decision on funding should be suspended at the very least until the impact of closure is assessed? First Minister. Well, services like this uh, perform a very important function and uh, I would certainly encourage uh, local councils to undertake full consultation and make sure that they're considering all of the implications of these decisions. I will ask the Health Secretary to look at this from the perspective of the Health Service to see whether there is more uh, that the government can offer by way of assistance. But I certainly hope the local council will take seriously uh, the issues that Christine Graham has raised today. Edward Mountain to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in 2015, I welcomed your government's announcement of a much-needed £60 million facility in Inverness. Work was due to start this summer and then was delayed till the end of 2019 with a price tag that had more than doubled. I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Health seven weeks ago asking about this facility and despite two chasing emails, have yet to receive a response. Given the orthopaedic waiting times in the Highlands now exceed 78 weeks, I and my constituents would like to know when work will start on the elective care centre for the north of Scotland and when it will be operational. First Minister. Uh, well, I understand the Health Secretary has uh, written to the member, but if he hasn't received that, I'm happy to look into that to make sure that that uh, letter arrives uh, with him. We are delivering a number of elective uh, treatment centres across the country as part of our waiting times improvement plan to make sure that we are building the capacity uh, to ensure uh, that the rising demand in the NHS can be met. And I'll make sure that the uh, member gets the response from the Health Secretary as quickly as possible. Beatrice Wishart to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you. Yesterday, people in Shetland and Orkney were appalled to learn that there's been a second legal challenge to the awarding of the Northern Isles Ferry Service contract. That's on top of an 18-month delay. Some people in the community are now questioning the competence of Transport Scotland. What reassurances can the First Minister give that the government is doing all it can to resolve the dispute quickly to limit the uncertainty over the future of a lifeline ferry service upon which people and businesses in the Northern Isles depend? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I share Beatrice Wishart's uh, concerns uh, about this. Obviously, as she says, this is uh, now a legal, uh, a legal action and therefore it would not be appropriate for me to uh, go into detail about these issues. Suffice to say the Scottish Government is confident in the processes that we have undertaken and will continue to defend that position uh, rigorously. Angus MacDonald. The First Minister will be aware of the major gas outage that uh, affected parts of Falkirk District from Sunday and through the first half of the week. It currently less than 250 of the 8,000 plus households affected remain unconnected today. It, will the First Minister join me in congratulating everyone involved in the Herculean effort to get people reconnected, not only the 300 gas engineers and support staff from SGN and beyond who descended on Falkirk District over the past few days, but also the multi-agency response from the police, Scottish Fire and Rescue, NHS Forth Valley and the Ambulance Service, Falkirk Council Social Services and the Housing Departments, and not forgetting the community effort who all deserve praise for the way the multi-agency approach has been handled. First Minister. Uh, yes, I would take this opportunity to thank everybody who uh, responded so promptly to ensure that the fault was repaired quickly um, and the process to safely reconnect uh, customers, which of course required engineers to visit all affected properties, uh, was able to happen in the timescale that it did. It is now close to completion. Uh, any home that is currently not back on the mains gas supply is due to engineers not being able to access properties. And I'm advised that as of 7pm uh, on the 4th of December, that was reported to be around uh, 80 properties. Um, but everybody here involved, uh, to use Angus MacDonald's uh, term, uh, did a, a Herculean effort, and I think everybody is to be congratulated. This was obviously inconvenient for everybody affected, uh, but it could have been much worse in terms of the time taken to fix it, and my thanks go to everybody who ensured that it was done so quickly. Thank you. Question three, Patrick Harvey. The First Minister knows of the misery being inflicted on the people living in the shadow of the Moss Moran gas plant operated by ExxonMobil, one of the world's most notorious corporate promoters of climate denial. They have failed to maintain the plant and as a result local residents endure regular unplanned flaring. The plant's operating permits have been breached, SEPA have issued final warning notices and in view of the health impacts NHS Fife has called the flaring unacceptable. The plant is currently shut down, but a restart is imminent, and the Scottish Greens have called for the community at least to be given a break over the holidays. So far, ExxonMobil have only committed not to restart from Christmas Eve to Boxing Day. Will the First Minister join me in calling on the operators to commit to no flaring over the entire Christmas and New Year period? First Minister. Um, on the specific question that Patrick Harvey has raised there, I will undertake uh, to ensure that that is discussed with uh, SEPA and that in turn it is discussed with the company. I, uh, on the face of it, don't think that is an entirely unreasonable request from uh, the local community because I do 
uh, appreciate the concerns and the anxieties, very understandable concerns and anxieties of the local community regarding flaring at the Miss Moran uh, complex. Uh, the recent frequency of unplanned flaring has been completely unacceptable uh, and SEPA and the Health and Safety Executive are monitoring developments closely as the plant restarts um, and uh, certainly that has to be done uh, with uh, I think minimum impact uh, and in a way that reduces the anxiety of uh, the local community so I'm happy to take uh, that particular request forward and feedback to Patrick Harvey once uh, I've had a chance to do so. Patrick Harvey. Well, I think the community will think it's more than reasonable. I think, it, I think they'll think it's absolutely necessary that we get this commitment from the, the plant operator before the Christmas holidays. On Channel 4's climate debate last week, the First Minister stated, we are in the transition. Well, Moss Moran is the second biggest polluter in Scotland, and many local people in Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath know that this is not the future their community deserves. They demand climate action, and to see that just transition taking place now and a Green New Deal for Fife. So can the First Minister tell the communities surrounding Moss Moran and the workforce, when will they see a just transition for Cowdenbeath actually get underway? What investment will be provided for an alternative future and lasting green jobs instead of corporations which profit from wrecking people's lives and our climate? First Minister. That is a just transition that is underway. It's exactly to uh, look at these issues of the justice of the transition uh, that we established the Just Transition Commission. I mean, there are uh, 170 or so jobs uh, currently provided by Ms Moran right now. Of course, we all want to see the move uh, to a, a greener uh, energy uh, system, and it's important that we do that in a way uh, that provides new jobs. That's why uh, we are investing uh, so much in uh, support for renewable energy, um, and we need to accelerate that. So I'm absolutely in agreement with Patrick Harvey um, about this. And, but in terms of the transition, we've seen from past uh, economic transformations what happens if we don't take people with us and uh, leave them behind. And we mustn't repeat those mistakes, which is why accelerating that transition, but doing it fairly and justly, is so important. Willie, question for Willie Rennie. Uh, the police is in crisis once again. With the resignation of Susan Deacon, that's now three chief constables, three chairs, and four chief executives in just a few short years. Today we learn the inspectorate don't think the authority either supports the police or scrutinizes the police. Yet the justice secretary thinks the organization is in a good place. Isn't this just a toxic mix of chaos and complacency? First Minister. Uh, no, and I I have to say to Willie Rennie, the police is not in crisis. And I think it does a disservice to the police officers around our country working so hard to keep us safe, uh, to say so. The chair of the SPA has tendered a resignation. Uh, she has her own reasons for doing that. But as I said a few moments ago, the vice chair uh, will take over the leadership of the police authority until a replacement is appointed through the appointments process. In the meantime, the SPA will go on with the job of responding to the recommendations that have been made by this Parliament's committee, by uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, continuing the improvements that are being made to governance and accountability. Um, and we will continue to support the police officers of our country doing the fantastic job that they do day in and day out, keeping crime levels low and making sure that the public of Scotland are kept safe. And I think all of us actually should thank them for doing that. Willie Rennie. Tell that to the third of police officers who are turning up to work mentally unwell. This government is not supporting the police. That's the last thing they are doing. The First Minister is in cloud cuckoo land if she is satisfied with this. Last week, the Justice Secretary said he was very satisfied with police mental health. But only 3% of police officers agreed with him. This week, the First Minister said violent crime was down when it's on the rise. Now the First Minister tells us the centralised functions of the Scottish Police Authority are sound. This government is way out of touch and it's way out of its depth. Ministers appointed all of these people, every single one of them, and left us with this mess of name calling and crisis. How many more years do we have to put up with this chaos? 
Centralisation has undermined our police. Why won't the First Minister just admit it that she is wrong and scrap the Police Act? First Minister. Well, let me deal with the uh, issues that I think Willie Rennie was raising in that question. Uh, firstly, I outlined to him uh, last week the number of initiatives that are being taken to support the health and well-being of our police officers. Uh, this government has uh, invested in and supported a thousand extra police officers on the streets of uh, Scotland, while elsewhere in the UK police officer numbers were being slashed. We've delivered the best pay rise for the police of any uh, police service across the UK. We will continue to support our police officers to do the fantastic work that they do to get crime levels down and keep the public of Scotland safe. Uh, but I have to say, presiding officer, on the morning after, uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrats was forced to apologise for the Liberal Democrats' support of Tory austerity, which has had such a damaging impact on our public services. I thought Willie Rennie might have had a bit more humility when he was talking about public services this morning. We have some, some further supplementary questions. The first from Rhoda Grant to be followed by Annie Wells. Rhoda Grant. CS Wind in Campbelltown is set to pay off 80% of its workforce, with a quarter of them being made redundant earlier this week. This has a terrible impact on the workers, their families, and indeed the whole community in Kintyre. What is the Scottish Government going to do to ensure that developers include local content and contracts that are let in Scotland to make sure that we all benefit from our natural resources? First Minister. Well, obviously the situation with CS Wind is extremely concerning and extremely regrettable and my thoughts are with uh, the workforce of that company. Um, PACE support has been provided to the workforce. Um, I understand that support has been received positively. In a, a broader sense, uh, Fergus Ewing has already convened uh, a summit uh, in uh, Campbelltown in order to uh, look at the implications of, of this and other uh, recent economic developments. A working group has been established to make sure that we're focusing um, on the actions that we need to take uh, to generate economic activity in Campbelltown because we understand uh, the blow that uh, a closure uh, like this or redundancies on this scale will have in a community of this size. But Fergus Ewing will be leading that work in the months to come and we'll be happy to keep the Parliament updated. Annie Wells to be followed by Keith Brown. First Minister, how many children and young people in Scotland are having to wait more than a year for mental health treatment? First Minister. Uh, too many children wait more than a year for mental health treatment. That is why we're investing uh, £250 million in improvements to uh, child and adolescent mental health services uh, to reduce waiting times in the specialist service, but crucially uh, to build up community services to get counsellors into schools, which is uh, work that is ongoing to establish the new community wellbeing service so that there are more uh, services and resources available for young people in the community uh, that then ensures that specialist services are there for those uh, who need it. So that work is extremely important. Uh, it's backed by investment and the government will continue to take it forward. Keith Brown to be followed by Ross Greer. Can I ask the First Minister what her response is to the recently published ONS report that has cut life expectancy for children born in the UK? The UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights report published earlier this year accused the Tory government of the systematic immiseration of a significant part of the British population. The findings in the ONS report coincide with the introduction of the Tory party's austerity and welfare reform obsession. How many more authoritative reports does she believe it will take to shame the Tory politicians into admitting that their government policies have forced many in my constituency and across Scotland and the UK into poverty? First Minister. Um, the, the findings of the ONS report are uh, deeply concerning and alarming, and they really do illustrate the fact that austerity, uh, welfare cuts, policies like universal credit and the bedroom tax have all helped to push people in general and children in particular into poverty. Uh, the Resolution Foundation has also said that the Conservative manifesto plans at this election risk taking child poverty in Scotland to a 60 year high. Um, that in my view is why we need to get rid of a Conservative government at this election because I don't think we'll ever shame the Conservatives into doing the right thing on poverty. We need to get rid of them completely and Scotland has an opportunity to do that next week. Ross Greer to be followed by Claire Adamson. 
Thank you. After a long-running freedom of information saga, I confirmed that in 2009, Kemring Energetics successfully applied for Scottish Enterprise funding to invest in site expansion to, in their own words, take advantage of market moves that have resulted in gaps in the manufacture of explosives. The Kemring site in question specialises in components for, again in their own words, rocket propulsion systems, release of airborne weapon systems, missile guidance systems, arming units and military demolition. The First Minister has repeatedly claimed that the Scottish Government does not fund the manufacture of munitions. Is it seriously her position that funding the expansion of a bomb making factory is different to funding the direct manufacture of bombs? Um, I'm happy to respond to Ross Green in more detail about the specific company, but it is absolutely the position that the Scottish Government does not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions, either directly or via Scottish Enterprise. <coughs> Support provided is focused on helping firms to diversify and develop non-military applications for their technology. That is the position of Scottish Enterprise uh, in relation to all companies uh, that apply to it for funding. And uh, on the specific company that Ross Greer has raised, I'm happy to respond in more detail in writing. Claire Adamson to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the First Minister aware of the comments this week from the independent health think tank, the Nuffield Trust, that warned that ending freedom of movement of EU citizens poses a very real risk to NHS staffing numbers? And does the First Minister agree that Scotland needs to escape Brexit and protect our public services? First Minister. Uh, I think we should take the warning of the Nuffield Trust very seriously. We know that ending freedom of movement will have an impact on our ability to grow our working age population and that will have perhaps a disproportionate impact on the ability of the NHS and other public services to attract and recruit the staff that they need. Uh, beyond that, I think free, ending freedom of movement sends the wrong signal about the kind of country we are. We uh, want to be a country that is open, outward looking and welcoming. Uh, I think we should do that uh, in line with our values as a country, but we need to be able to do that to attract the people that we need to have a, a growing and thriving economy. And I hope all parties in this chamber uh, will reject policies like ending freedom of movement, policies like a hostile environment and be determined uh, that we keep ensuring that Scotland is the kind of country that attracts people from all over the world to make the amazing contribution that immigrants make to our economy and to our society. Jenny Mara to be followed by Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, last weekend three people lost their lives in the community of Lochy Dundee due to drugs. Drugs workers predict that Scotland's drugs death rate, the worst in the world, will rise again this year. Dundee's Drug Commission laid out 10 immediate and emergency recommendations, including same-day prescribing, in August this year. But not one of those recommendations, including that life-saving recommendation of same-day prescribing, has been implemented. I do not understand why. First Minister, for families across Dundee and Scotland, can you please urge the NHS in Tayside and the Council to move forward with these life-saving recommendations as soon as possible? First Minister. Uh, the Public Health Minister has uh, engaged already with the Dundee Drugs Commission, I think rightly so. It made a number of important recommendations and I think it is important that we move forward with those recommendations uh, as quickly as is uh, feasible to do. Uh, I'm more than happy to get uh, Joe Fitzpatrick to write to the member with an update of how that work is being taken forward as well as an update on how the work of our wider drugs death task force is being taken forward because this is undoubtedly one of the most important issues uh, that we face uh, and we are determined uh, to introduce the changes to how we deal with drugs uh, misuse and how we support uh, the users uh, of drugs to make sure that we make a difference to these figures. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, in an answer to Willie Rennie on the SPA, the First Minister said there was no crisis. In the Chair's resignation letter, she said that the governance and accountability arrangements for policing in Scotland are fundamentally flawed in structure, culture and practice. Given these comments, will the First Minister and her Justice Secretary carry out an immediate review to learn what has gone wrong with the SNP's centralisation project, why another senior figure in public life has quit, and what can be done to fix her government's mess? First Minister. Um, look, S Susan Deacon is absolutely entitled to her opinion on that, and I am very happy to hear, hear the basis on which uh, she has reached that conclusion. But I do not agree with that conclusion. There has been no shortage of uh, reviews of and inquiries 
into the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, recommendations have been made which have been taken forward and uh, of course we see improvements that have been made which are recognised by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. So we will continue to take forward those improvements, of course listening to uh, the views of Susan Deakin and others. But you know, I think it is uh, doing a better service to our police officers working so hard across the country if we support them in that job and support the Scottish Police Authority to get on with the essential job of scrutiny and accountability that they carry out. Question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to reduce the disability employment gap. First Minister. In December 2018, we published a Fairer Scotland for Disabled People, uh, an employment action plan setting out the steps we will take to reduce the disab disability employment gap in Scotland by at least half. Uh, that includes setting a target for the employment of disabled people within the Scottish Government's own workforce as published in the Recruitment and Retention Plan for Disabled People. Although there has been a small reduction in the disability employment gap in recent years, uh, we recognise there is still a significant uh, amount of work to do and we will be publishing the first annual progress report on the action plan early next year. Chair McMillan. Thank the First Minister for that reply. And the First Minister will be aware that Sunday the 1st of December marked the International Day of Persons with Disabilities and I welcome the Scottish Parliament's new powers over disability benefits so Scotland can put dignity and respect at the heart of our welfare system. Does the First Minister agree with me that more modern apprenticeships for people with additional support needs, possibly tied in with environmental projects, could be one way of increasing the level of people with disabilities in employment? Uh, yes, I do agree with that. Uh, through the Modern Apprenticeship Equality Action Plan, we offer enhanced contribution rates for modern apprentices uh, that self-identify as disabled. In 2018-19, uh, 3,700 uh, modern apprenticeship starts identified as having an impairment, health condition or learning difficulty, um, and that's up from 990 in 2015-16 when the plan was introduced. Over 60% of modern apprentice frameworks now include outcomes or units that reference low carbon, sustainability or energy efficiency. Uh, there is still a lot of work to be done here, uh, and we will continue to work with employers to further reduce the disability employment gap. Jeremy Balfour. Does the First Minister admit she is failing Scottish disabled people with a current disability employment gap of 35.8%, woefully lagging behind the UK figure of 28.9%? First Minister. Well, of course, the disability employment gap in Scotland, as I said in my original answer, has reduced. The, the reduction is too small, but it's reduced from uh, over 37% uh, in 2016 to 30 five and a half percent now. We want to drive that uh, further down, which is why we're taking the range of actions uh, that are set out in the action plan, some of which I've touched on uh, today. Uh, I think, though, given uh, some of the pressures that have been on uh, people with disabilities from uh, welfare cuts, uh, all of us have to recognise the responsibility to treat disabled people with dignity uh, and to support them into employment wherever possible. And I think that's a lesson uh, that we certainly take seriously, but it's a lesson that I think could well be learned by the current Conservative government at Westminster. Question number six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Macmillan Cancer Support Study, which suggests that there's been a 15% increase in cancer diagnosis since 2015. First uh, I thank Macmillan uh, for what is an important report. Increasing numbers of people are being diagnosed with cancer, partly due to the ageing population, but also, of course, due to improved detection. The Detect Cancer Early and Screening programmes are increasing the proportion of breast, bowel and lung cancers that are detected at early stages. Uh, we're working to ensure we have the right staff in place to respond to this. NHS Scotland's staffing levels are higher than ever, and we're working in partnership with Macmillan to ensure that every cancer patient has access to a dedicated support worker, which, of course, frees clinical staff time for health care. It is our ambition, it should be everybody's ambition, to beat cancer and support every person who is fighting it. And I am very encouraged that we're seeing a continued downward trend in cancer mortality rates. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for those words? Uh, Macmillan's figures show that a quarter of a million people are now living with cancer in Scotland, and that number is expected to rise to 300,000 by 2025. And I know that this is an issue which has affected uh, many of us in this chamber. Uh, we also commend the hard work and care that our NHS, NHS staff and the third sector provide those living with cancer. But First Minister, the numbers do speak for themselves. In a recent cancer patient survey, 40% uh, of patients said that they felt that they were not receiving enough care or support. 60% of nurses say that they feel under too much pressure. And there has been a 26% increase in nurse 
vacancies, which undeniably is adding pressure to staff. Janice Preston, who heads Macmillan in Scotland, said the following of staff. They are struggling under the weight of the ever-increasing numbers of people who they need to help, and it's heartbreaking to hear from staff who feel like they are failing cancer patients because they just don't have enough time. First Minister, how do you respond to that comment? And why do you think that so many cancer patients feel like they are not getting the care and support that they need? First Minister. Well, every cancer patient uh, should get the quality of care uh, and also support, because I think that is uh, an important distinction that they need. Uh, staff numbers in our NHS generally are at a record high. We saw that uh, in the figures published this week. Uh, but in terms of cancer specifically, uh, there's been since 2006 an 80% increase in consultant oncologists working in our NHS and uh, an almost 50%, 48.7% increase in consultant radiologists. Uh, so we need to continue to increase the numbers of staff in our health service. Uh, but I mentioned in my original answer the partnership between the Scottish Government and Macmillan, uh, which is a pioneering partnership, the first part of the UK to do this, to make sure that we are investing jointly uh, to ensure that every single cancer patient has access to a dedicated support worker. That's something that was widely and warmly welcomed when the Health Secretary and I announced it with Macmillan uh, recently. Um, and that's important for two reasons, because it does give cancer patients access to the emotional support that they need. And as uh, the member rightly says, there's not a single one of us in this chamber who doesn't know through family and friends the emotional impact that cancer has. But crucially, that kind of service also then helps to free up the time of clinicians to focus on the clinical and healthcare uh, aspects of, of treatment. So these are important issues. I, thank Jamie Green for raising them today, but both in terms of the increase in, in clinical uh, workers in our health service, but this pioneering uh, project uh, in partnership with Macmillan, I do believe will make a real and tangible and meaningful difference to cancer patients in the years to come. David Stewart. <coughs> uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware that positron emission tomography scanners are a vital tool in cancer treatment, but they're all concentrated south of the Highland Line. Will the First Minister support my campaign to have a PET scanner within the Highlands and Islands to help cancer diagnoses and send a message about sharing out health services throughout the whole of Scotland and avoiding centralisation? First Minister. Um, I absolutely uh, understand the importance of PET scanning. Uh, we want to make sure that people have access to that kind of uh, scanning and, of course, access to treatment as close to home as possible. We'll, uh, consider all of these issues in our capital investment programme. I'm uh, not aware of uh, Dave Stewart's uh, campaign in, in the specifics, but I'm happy to have a look at that and discuss uh, with the health secretary. We'll discuss uh, with the local health board. But there has been uh, a range of initiatives in recent years in the provision of cancer services that are about making sure that people get access as close to home <coughs> as possible, recognising uh, that people need uh, the highest quality specialist care uh, where that is best provided. Uh, so I'm happy to ask the health secretary to uh, liaise further uh, with the member about the specific provision of a scanner in his uh, own region. And question seven, Colin Smith. Thank you, First Minister. To ask the Officer, thank, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that ScotRail fares will increase by 2.4% in January. First Minister. Well, uh, no increase in uh, rail fares uh, are ever welcome for the travelling public, and I absolutely recognise that. But this Government has taken action to keep uh, fares down. Regulated ScotRail peak fares are capped at the level of the retail price index and regulated off-peak fares at 1% below RPI, making fares at 20% cheaper on average than they are in the rest of Great Britain. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, under your government, regulated rail fares have rocketed by 54%. That's a massive £1,500 hike for a season ticket for a worker travelling between Glasgow and Edinburgh has gone up by 13% alone under the current Abelio franchise. Now, given the fact that this franchise has never hit a single, a single punctuality target since the first year of the franchise, why are Scotland's long-suffering rail passengers being hit by yet another fare hike? Why does the First Minister think passengers and not the private rail firms should have to pay the price of Abelio's and this government's failure in running our railways? First Minister. Well, of course... Uh Two, two thirds of the cost of running the railway is already met through the Scottish Government, the subsidy we provide uh, to our rail services. It is also the case that because of the capping arrangements 
on rail fares. Uh, fares are on average 20% cheaper in Scotland than they are elsewhere in Great Britain. Uh, no increase in rail fares uh, is welcome. That is why we take the action we do to keep them as low as possible. And we'll continue to do that, just as we will continue uh, to make sure that uh, the franchise holder uh, delivers the improvements in the quality of service that they are committed to delivering. And of course, we'll uh, continue to take forward longer term plans, uh, looking at the possibility of uh, a public sector bidder uh, for the franchise in future. Um, so these are hard actions that we will continue to take. I think they are right um, and they balance the need to have proper funding in our rail service with keeping fares for the travelling public as low as possible. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Claire Baker on Scan Art in Action campaign. And, but we'll just have a, a short suspension to allow members, ministers and members of the gallery to uh, rejoin us. A short suspension.